one of the measures of your wisdom is the extent to which you have a sense of yourself. When the Buddha was talking about this theme, he wasn't talking about some sort of mystical knowledge of the self. It was more having a sense of where your strengths and weaknesses are, and how you can build on your strengths to overcome your weaknesses. Because after all, as you practice, even though you may be listening to a Dharma talk, living with a teacher, still the teacher can't get into your head and say, okay, do this, focus there. If you're lucky to have a teacher who has the ability to read your mind, that's one thing. But even then, the teacher's not going to be there for 24 hours every day. You've got to learn how to gauge what's going on in your own mind and become your own teacher. And one of the prime lessons we learned from looking at the Buddha becoming his own teacher was noticing where he was causing himself unnecessary stress, unnecessary suffering. In some cases it's obvious. In other cases it's more subtle. Sometimes you're holding on to a Dharma teaching you think is absolutely good Dharma, but it's not the right teaching for that particular time, that particular place. And so you end up even using the Dharma to create suffering. One of John Lee's recommendations is turning things inside out. If you're holding on to something, well, what if the opposite were true? Or if you think you're holding on to something that's giving you pleasure, ask yourself, what if it were destroyed? Last night I was talking to a woman who's got an art studio, and she was complaining that sometimes in her meditation she would spend the whole session of the meditation thinking about her art, whatever projects she had going. And so I recommended that prior to the meditation, or at the very beginning step of the meditation, just imagine torching the whole studio. Nothing left of any of her artworks, past, present, or future. And the idea is a little startling, and that's the whole point. To ask yourself, suppose your art studio were no longer there, everything had been trashed. And it's amazing to realize that part of the mind would actually be happy. I had a friend years back who was working on being a novelist. He had written a novel, he was very proud of it, but it required constant tinkering. And then a few months later I learned that he had burned the whole manuscript. He said it was the most liberating event in his life as a writer. So sometimes the things that you hold to dearly, not only in terms of things but also ideas you hold to in your mind, you have to experiment dropping them for a bit to see what the results would be, which parts of the mind would actually be lighter, which parts of the mind would actually feel less burdened. Even the things around which you create a very strong sense of your goodness as a person, and it's good to imagine them just not being there. And of course there's the body. A lot of people say they're not attached to their body, they don't understand why we have these chants about the 32 parts of the body. It seems to be a lot of negativity. But it's to remind you that this body you're depending on is not all that dependable. What would you do if you didn't have it? Or what would you do if parts of it were paralyzed, parts of it were 
unusable. And the immediate thought comes in, of course, is that you really are attached to the body after all. And then the next question is, well, can you use that thought to help spur you in the practice? Because after all, there will come a time when you just can't use the body anymore. It won't move. Your eyesight will go. Your hearing will go. All the things with which you connect with the world have to come through the senses of the body. Do you have something in the mind that would be willing to or be able to find a sense of well-being even then? The thought may sound negative, but if you can get positive use out of it, it gives you a sense of renewed purpose in the practice. Contemplation the unattractiveness of the body, the certainty of death, of course, the uncertainties of death. There's that story in one of the commentaries about the Buddha talking to this young girl who's very wise. And he asks her, do you know? She says, yes. And he says, do you really know? She says, well, no. But do you know? She says, yes. Then he leaves. Her parents are upset with her. I said, why are you talking back and forth with the Buddha like this? And she said, he's asked me if I know I'm going to die. And I said, yes. Do you really know when? Well, no. But you do know that you're going to die. Yes. She said that was his meaning. And many times we view these meditation objects as negative ones. In fact, the Buddha talks about contemplating the body, contemplating death, as painful practice. But you'd be surprised at how liberating some of these contemplations can be, especially when you realize to the extent, the extent to which you're holding on to things that are really weighing the mind down unnecessarily in areas that are related to the body. Related to your identity of who you are in this lifetime. So even though these practices are painful practices, remember they have a positive side. As the Buddha said, when contemplation of the death, when it's done rightly, leads to the deathless. You might also say that contemplation of the body, when it's done rightly, leads to a happiness that doesn't have to depend on the body. It also helps cut through a lot of things you think, well, in order to be happy I need things just to be this way, that way. We're meeting this now, of course, with the heat wave coming through. But you realize the heat wave is an affair of the body. It doesn't have to impinge on the mind. And if you can develop a sense of detachment from the, the affairs of the body and just leave them at the body, not drag them into the mind, there's a great sense of freedom that can come with that. So look at the positive side of these painful practices, because they are your friends. John Swat made the point many, many times that we get everything backwards. We think suffering is our enemy and craving is our friend. He said if you can learn how to look at the pains of life, look at the sufferings in life, and gain discernment, you can free yourself from them. As for your cravings, you have to learn how to dissociate yourself from them. and be very leery of what they're telling you. Otherwise, uh, to use a John Fogg's phrase, lead you around by the nose. These images of a water buffalo that's got a ring in its nose, and they tie a rope to it, and wherever they pull the rope, the water buffalo's got to go because it hurts so much with the ring. And it's the same with the affairs of the body. And a lot of the other things that you hold on to as being really precious. They're a ring through your nose. These contemplations for the purpose of taking the ring out so you're free to go where you want. 
You don't have to be pulled around. You don't have to be a slave to craving. So these painful practices can lead to joy. Always keep that side of them in mind. <laughs>